At a difficult time for what we now call the Indo-Pacific, everyone knew where Menzies stood. There was never any doubt about that. Menzies didn't need opinion polls to tell him how best to secure the interests of Australia and other like-minded countries. So too with John Howard. At home, he knew what, uh, uh, that for Australia to succeed, it had to keep reforming its market-based economy. Economic reform is seldom popular, as we know, and it requires both courage and effort to persuade the public that it's in the nation's best interests. With the Howard government's new tax system, it achieved that, as it did with some of its industrial relations reforms. John Howard knew that if Australia didn't keep reforming its economy, productivity would flag and growth would fall away. Australia would stagnate and slip behind its competitors. Internationally, John Howard shared the conviction of Robert Menzies that Australia's security above all lay not just in its defence force, but in securing strong alliances, especially with the United States. The controversial decisions the Howard government made to support the Americans in both Afghanistan and Iraq weren't about political convenience and opinion polls, I can assure you. Those decisions were about ensuring that liberal democratic allies stuck together in confronting global challenges. It didn't make any sense for Australia to be nothing more than a selfish ally of convenience. Alliances will never work unless they have broad, if not universal, application. So, so much of what I've just said seems, I guess, to all of you here this evening, self-evident. But at the time, the values and policies of Menzies and Howard were ridiculed and attacked by their political opponents. The reason they seem self-evident today is because both Menzies and Howard won the political debates at the time, including the big debates about values. Sometimes they were popular, often they were not, but these two men were leaders of conviction and courage and they pressed on regardless. We remember Menzies and Howard today in the same way as we remember a small number of great leaders in the post-war era. We remember, well I remember, um, Conrad Adenauer for his capacity to rebuild post-war Germany as an active member of the Western Alliance and the liberal market economy. West Germany had choices and deep debate in Germany about whether to be neutral in the Cold War or to back the Americans and the liberal democracies. It was Adenauer who persuaded them to do the latter and that had huge consequences for the evolution of Europe. We also remember leaders like Thatcher and Reagan, not just because of their personalities and their splendid communication skills, but because of their courage and their convictions. Their convictions, by the way, turned out to be right. They took head on the prevailing orthodoxy of a mixed economy and promoted liberal market solutions, which worked. Their convictions that the Soviet Union had to be confronted and ultimately defeated were ridiculed and derided at the time by supporters of detente and what was called Ostpolitik. But they turned out to be heroically right. For someone who believes in the virtue of the selfless individual as a core value, the Soviet Union was anathema. That is why Reagan described it as the evil empire. So all of that is history, but by the way, it's very important to understand your own history and the history of your civilization. What then are the challenges of today? I think there are two aspects to this question. First, there's, there is the one of values. Over the last few years, the, value de the values debate has been won by the progressive left, 
and they now like, they now like to call themselves being too ashamed to use the term socialist. I used to like calling them socialists. They've captured what journalists would now like to call the zeitgeist of the era. They're happy to see an ever-growing proportion of the GDP controlled by the state, thereby undermining the core value of freedom of the individual and limiting productivity growth. On social issues, they've become passionate advocates of identity politics. We're not defined as human beings, as creatures made in the image of God. We're defined by characteristics over which we have no control, such as our race, our gender, or even our sex lives. This trend towards the progressive left has been accelerated by both climate change and most recently by the pandemic. Climate change has been an opportunity for the progressive left to exercise massive interventions in the economy. That does explain why they are such enthusiastic supporters of these, of these measures. Um, many, many of those measures, by the way, are likely to be completely ineffectual. Climate change is seen as a way of injecting the state into almost every aspect of society and expanding the role of government by increasing the regulation of society. So just in case you're wondering, I'm not a heretic, I don't think climate change is a myth. It is happening, but it's best addressed by investing in research and development in new technologies, including nuclear technology, rather than imposing greater central control on every aspect of society by the state. All political parties, be they on the left or the centre-right, need to be addressing the issue of CO2 emissions and adaptation measures. But to use this issue as a way of destroying aspects of a liberal society is going to end up in disaster. It was the pandemic which accelerated this process of enhanced state control. Governments, for right or for wrong, took control of almost every aspect of society, denying individuals the right to choose how they responded to the threat of COVID. That's fair enough. People supported that. What is more, the huge increase in spending which was associated with lockdowns worldwide and which ter in turn has generated both inflation and higher interest rates has taken away notions of individual choice and effort. Added, added to this encroachment of the state into every aspect of our societies has been the development of identity politics. Although identity politics may have had its philosophical origins in France, I must concede that, identity politics in a political sense has emerged from the United States. And I must say to you, it makes me smile to remember how we liberals have always been attacked by the left for being too close to the Americans, yet the progressive left has swallowed like a whale-consuming krill almost every aspect of the American identity politics debate. When a black man was tragically murdered in Minneapolis, this led to demonstrations even here in Australian cities. Yet the murder of the Uyghur people in, um, in Xinjiang is largely ignored by the progressive left. I can understand the George Floyd, uh, George Floyd issue capturing the public debate in the United States, but for it, for it to have spread to other parts of the Western world speaks volumes, not just for the soft power of the United States, but the evolution of identity politics as a concept. What is surprising is that outside of some elements of the United States polity, the opponents of the progressive left have seldom fought back. They have simply talked of modifying some of the excesses of the progressive left but in turn have subconsciously conceded the intellectual ground to them. They have offered nothing more than management. For most of my uh, life, 
right-thinking people have regarded a society structured around race as anathema. We abhorred apartheid. We denounced discrimination on the basis of race in the United States. We celebrated the evolution of, a multiracial, of multiracial societies. And more than that, we abhorred discrimination against women, and I never thought of myself it was right to demonize homosexuality. But in recent years, the progressive left has shifted society to a new era of discrimination. Now we are to discriminate against men, against white people, against what is rudely described, in my view, rudely described as cisgender people. If discrimination was wrong, well, it still is. What is more, pitting people against each other on the basis of their gender and their race is obviously, by definition, deeply divisive. We need to learn the lessons of history. Societies which have been divided into tribal groups, groups ethnicity or race are doomed to catastrophic failure. Ethnic identity was at the heart of the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. Ethnic divides catapulted the Balkans into bloody conflict in the 1990s. Racial divide made South Africa a bitter and, un, and unsustainable society. The societies which have worked best have been built on the foundations of tolerance, not division. And they're societies which respect and treasure each individual person, regardless of their physical characteristics. In Australia, egalitarianism has been a core value. We've not always lived up to that value throughout our history, I admit that. But despite our failings, we've held egalitarianism dear. Today, we're confronted with a decision, for example, over establishing the voice, a forum for people of one race and only for people of one race. To assume that a percentage of Australians based on their race alone, um, not the myriad characteristics which make up an individual, can set up a separate institution is inevitably going to become in time divisive. It says something for the proponents of this policy that they think a particular race of people is likely to have one set of opinions in clear distinction from the rest of society, that their opinions are based on the color of their skin. It speaks volumes for the success of the progressive left that those who fear the voice will be divisive are cowered into silence by an avalanche of abuse and denigration. Now, this is but a minor challenge facing the believers in individual freedom. I'd, identif I'd identify uh, three other major issues which are going to be with us for a long time and all of which need to be addressed by the centre-right of politics. First, there is the ageing of the population. I've already spoken about economics and explained that the growing role of the state in managing the economy is not only likely to lead to a suboptimal allocation of scarce resources, but also, more importantly, take away decision-making for individuals and transfer those de decisions to the state. Huge budget deficits on an unprecedented scale, ballooning public debt that, as we can now see, are inflationary and causing interest increases in interest rates. They have the potential to take away the freedom of individuals for generations to come. Looking ahead, all the signs are that the role of the state is likely to grow unless attempts are made to address issues in a different way. We have an ageing population which will increase the burden on funding retirement incomes, uh, so too with health expenditure. As things currently stand, an ever-growing proportion of government expenditure will be dedicated to health and aged care. This was an issue flagged by the Howard government in its intergenerational reports almost two decades ago but still we have no apparent answer to this challenge. 
the centre-right of Western politics will have to think through creative solutions to this dilemma based on their core va values. As society pours an increasing proportion of its resources into an ageing population, that will have significant consequences for younger people. As things stand, there is a redistribution of wealth in most Western countries from young working people to uh, elderly retired people. Now, don't get me wrong, I may have a vested interest in that as a baby boomer myself, but I don't think society does. House building has not kept pace with demand and the dream of home ownership, which Menzies made such a huge issue of um, in his time, is now beyond the means of many young people. This is a huge problem. I'm not sure that I've got the statistics exactly right, but I think in 1966, by the time Menzies retired, around 70% of Australians owned their own homes. And uh, today, it wouldn't be much above 50%. That, for me, strikes me as a huge, a huge social problem and one that political parties need to address. I know the Morrison government gave a lot of thought to this issue. Perhaps the Turnbull and Morrison governments both gave a lot of thought to this issue. But it needs to be a front and centre preoccupation for centre-right political parties for whom home ownership has been a central part of their vision of a property-owning democracy in which all people have a part. Secondly, we have to face the impact on society of technology. Social media, one of the consequences of the spread of digital technology, has many upsides. It does help us keep in touch with what's in, happening to our friends and families, but also uh, with events around the world. But social media has had a significant impact on, this, on the uh, interaction between people. It is herding people into narrow silos and within the silos, opposing views are subject to extreme abuse and denigration. What is more, it has led to less understanding of the interconnectedness of issues and the complexity of trying to resolve social and economic problems. We've seen a dramatic example of that over the last few years. People are demanding action on climate change, as I've discussed, and in particular, a reduction in the use of fossil fuels to generate energy. On the other hand, they haven't taken into consideration always until now the impact this will have on energy bills, on the competitiveness of the economy, on inflation, and ultimately on employment prospects. Yet all of these things, of course, in reality, must be balanced. I notice with wry amusement, Joe Biden spending over a trillion dollars on reducing the dependence of the United States on fossil fuels and winning the applause of progressives for that. But weeks later, he was flying to Riyadh to beg Mohammed bin Sultan, the, is the crown prince of uh, Saudi Arabia, to increase Saudi oil production in order to reduce the cost of, yep, you guessed it, fossil fuels. So th this interconnectedness um, needs to be explained better to people, and my argument is that social media and the dependence of people on social media has stopped people generally understanding the interconnectedness of policies. So social media, in a way, um, substantially simplifies issues. And that's all very well, but it can restrict not just debate, but thoughtful debate. It's one thing to be concerned about global warning, warming, but the consequences of global warming are very much debated, and it's important that we're able to reflect on those consequences and make balanced judgments about what is in the overall best interests of society. It's hard to do that through the simplistic and abusive screaming of social media. Thirdly, technological change is always with us, and that's a good thing. And we need to try to anticipate where technology is going next. The advent of what is called artificial intelligence 
And by that I'm particularly focusing not just on clever computers, but um, computers learning themselves, what is sometimes called machine learning, beyond what the human mind can compute itself. That is in time going to have a significant implication for how society works. Many jobs that currently exist will cease to exist, but I've always said don't worry too much about that. New ones will be created. Um, and as the nature, but as the nature of work changes, so, so, so social attitudes will change with it. Artificial intelligence will create a number of substantial ethical and even regulatory issues. To what extent will we allow machines to make autonomous decisions, particularly, by the way, in relation to the battlefield? If we're going to regulate artificial intelligence, how are we going to regulate it? And when it comes to international rivalry or even combat, to what extent will it be possible to get an international agreement to limit weapons systems driven by artificial intelligence and that act autonomously rather than being driven by human beings? With the advent of quantum computing, these are going to be very substantial issues for statesmen to consider over the next few years. And that brings me to my fourth challenge, the rise of China. Like many commentators, I don't believe in drawing a straight line trajectory of China's economic and political growth. Indeed, I think there are signs that China's relative position is beginning to flat line as growth tapers off. But China is a country of over a billion people. And whether we like it or not, it's going to continue to be a central player in global politics. Leadership requires a strategy, and we do need a strategy for dealing with China. Put simply, we need to contribute to a power balance in the Indo-Pacific region so that at no time will China be able to exercise hegemony over the region. If that were to happen, then the region would become dangerously destabilised. A power balance in the Indo-Pacific region requires alliances. I think we've been successful in turning the trilateral security dialogue, an initiative of the Howard government, well, actually of its foreign minister, um, into, in, into, the, uh, into what is now called the Quad, which includes India. Um, and then I think we've been, the Morrison government was very successful, and it was really an Australian initiative, in developing the AUKUS um, arrangement, which is about more than just nuclear submarines. It also contemplates collaboration on military level artificial intelligence and cyber security, which will be the key to battlegrounds in the future. But it would be a mistake to think that containment of China, as distinct from power balance, is a sensible policy. Whatever we may think of the Communist Party regime, we have to accept that China will be, the, be with us for the long term. And when we're making politi policies, we have to think about the medium and the long term. A policy of containment would not contribute to the development of a mechanism for coexistence between liberal democracies and China. The two key phrases that encapsulate China policy should be power balance and coexistence. An appropriate power balance will contribute to dissuading China from undertaking military adventurism, particularly in the South China Sea and importantly in Taiwan. Coexistence means working with China in areas where collaboration makes sense, such as dealing with climate change, pandemics and international terrorism. Although it makes sense to resist China's cyber offensive ambitions and be wary of its own development of quantum computing and artificial intelligence, that is not an argument for cutting off our trade and investment relationship with China. That should continue to be mutually beneficial. It might superficially be popular to pursue a policy of containment of China, but as I've said, it is not a long-term policy. Statesmanship requires the capacity to think strategically in the medium to long term, not just to present, uh, respond to events on any one day. 
There are many other important issues which the statesmen or statespeople, I suppose we would say, of the future need to address, and I haven't time, you'll be pleased to hear, to touch on all of them here. But let me return to where I began. In our country, as elsewhere, there is a great need for statesmanship. Statesmanship based on the timeless values of a liberal democratic society and a capacity to make judgments, not all of which will be popular, about how to address the trends and the issues which we all face. These days, too much of politics is nothing more than managerial expediency. How often in private conversations do you hear politicians saying that this policy or that policy may not be popular, they've done the polling and the pub public don't like it and so they're not going to do it. The challenge isn't that, isn't to do the polling. The challenge is to communicate with the public and explain to the public what policies are in the country's best interests. Great leaders are able to do that. It doesn't take greatness to get opinion polls done and parrot back to the public what has been heard in those opinion polls. But remember, the public in general um, will, will be um, absolutely preoccupied with their own daily lives. And they're not spending hours and days contemplating macroeconomic trends, demographic challenges, the shifting tectonic plates of geopolitics. It's the job of political leaders to deal with those issues and to draw them to the attention of the public and to pers persuade the public of the wise course to follow. So that was the genius of Menzies and Howard. They had four characteristics that all great leaders have. They've understood history and the trends of history. They have political courage, and when there were setbacks, they simply hunkered down and prepared for the next battle. They didn't despair, and they didn't give up. They both had a capacity to understand the Australian public and the country's moods, without being slaves to opinion pollsters and political advisers with their cunning plans for electoral victory. And although both leaders were at times unpopular within their party, and even spurned by their party in their early years, they learned to manage their colleagues with supreme skill and diplomacy. Such leaders don't come along very often, but they do come along. Thank you. Thank you.